so glad to see everyone here this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for choosing to be at Broadway. If you are joining us online, we thank you for being with us as well. I hope that you have come with an expectant heart. I hope you're expecting wonderful things. And I also hope that you have come ready to sing praises to God. Will you please stand and sing with us?
love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will see of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness. His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord bless you. His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, He is for you.
Thank you. Thank you for being for us. Thank you for being with us. God, thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to die on a cross in our place. So that your spirit now goes with us and works through us. Father, we pray that prayer not just over our life, over the lives of so many that we come in contact with. God, we want them to know that you are for them, that you are with them, and that, God, you want to be working in them and through them. Father, the way that we get to share that is by telling people are for them, that you are with them, and God, sharing with them how much you love them, that you want to work in and through them. So, Father, help us today to not just receive words and receive good, Father, but turn around and show good to others so that they see you. Lord, I pray this morning that as we read your word and, and Father, we look at what you prepared for us to, to read today and, and to study today, that you would, God, turn our hearts inward to what you've done in us, but then, Father, move our hearts outward to what you want to do in the world around us. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It's now time for Children's Church. If you have a child between the ages of four and second grade and would like for them to attend, just have a meet at the middle back door. And remember at the end of the service to go down the stairs to sign them out. Thank you, Sherry. Good morning. Mr. Alex Scott in the house. Stand up there, Alex. Turn around and stand up in your seat where everybody can see you. Good, good. This is Alex Scott. Let me show you what happened to Alex yesterday. Y'all have that little video ready? There's some volume to that. Very good. Congratulations, Alex. And Alex was a little bitty fella. He attended here quite often. Uh, he has since moved to, uh, to the Huntsville area. And uh, he was talking to his grandmother and granddaddy this week. And said he wanted to go to heaven when he died. And uh, they talked to him about Jesus and told him one of the things he needed to do would be baptized. And he said, well, where do I get baptized? And uh, he said, well, I want to get baptized in y'all's church. So. We, uh, we baptized him yesterday, all in favor of accepting him as a member of our church. Would you let him know by hearty praise the Lord? That's our way of saying welcome to our fellowship, Adam. Alex. You're a part of us now, so we're glad to have you. Hate you having to spend your first day here as a baptized believer with Paul and Diane, but uh, we all have our cross to bear. Well, I'm uh, glad that you're here this morning. Glad that I am here this morning. Today, I want to talk with you about the discipline of worship. If I could require the reading of any book, I believe this would be at least one of the books that I would require for every Christian to read. Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian Life by Donald S. Whitley. Uh, Greg Chapman does a book study from time to time, and basically he makes assignments, and then we, after we do our reading... For the week, we will meet on a particular day on Zoom, and uh, we will have ongoing discussion uh, about our reading assignments for the week. And this is the book that we just finished a few weeks ago. And by the way, he's starting a book 
I think on June the 21st, is that right? June the 21st, it's uh, on the Holy Spirit. So if you'd like to be a part of that uh, group, I know he'd love to let you be a part of that and you can join us June 21st if you'll just see him. Uh, he'll let you know about the book and uh, actually he'll get some information from you and start handing out assignments here in the next few weeks. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it's always a great time. Uh, when it comes to worship, uh, I was so surprised to see that Donald Whitley had listed early in his book the issue of worship being a discipline. Now, I grew up in a Christian family, uh, always went to church. Matter of fact, my sister, after my mother died, uh, found a baptism, a certificate of baptism uh, that was given to my daddy the year I was born. I know that doesn't mean anything to you all, but uh, it means a whole lot to me. Uh, I know he was baptized the year I was born, and uh, so it, very excited. But anyway, uh, I always grew up in church, always going to church, and I never thought of worship as being a discipline. I was so caught off guard by this that I went back to a book I had to read when I was in college entitled The Celebration of Discipline, and uh, Richard Foster in that book, Celebration of Discipline, actually lists worship as a discipline in that book, but discipline is way toward the back of his book. I guess that's one of the reasons it didn't stand out to me the way it did in Donald Whitley. And I always thought, you know, people go to church, Christian people go to church. But in Whitley's book, one of the things that he talks about is how a lot of people who show up for worship services are not really engaged or involved in the worship experience. A lot of times we just kind of go through the motion. And we don't really discipline ourselves to be involved, at least in a heart level, with our worship of God. Worshiping God is not just necessarily attending a worship service. It is being involved. It is being a part of what's going on. It is uh, being a part of the song service. As Rick Warren, uh, many of you remember, we uh, looked at his stuff, uh, Five Purposes of a Church, several years ago. One of the things that Rick Warren says is that real genuine worship is expressing love to God. Not just showing up for a service to say I attended, but actually having a part in expressing my love to God. In talking about the different types of music that people enjoy or different styles of music, and you'll understand what he's talking about if you just think about the difference between this service and our first service, two completely different styles of music. But Rick Warren says the best style of worship is the one that most authentically represents your love for God. Whichever way you fully engage with God. Now, I've, I've just been thinking all week long about how, you know, we have private worship and we have corporate worship. Then in my Sunday school lesson this morning, uh, Andy Stanley mentioned that if you have corporate worship, it gives you the opportunity to worship him privately, but you really can't worship him privately without being a part of that corporate worship. I wish I had the words to repeat exactly what he said, but it made a whole lot of sense when he talked about how we worship together even as we worship alone. And sometimes if you are disciplined in worshiping God, you may actually help someone else to worship God as you yourself worship God. Uh, there are people that my wife just loves to sit with as she worships because their worship tends to generate her worship to some degree. Now I want us this morning to look at Ephesians chapter 1 in verse number 3 and following. The Apostle Paul begins with these words, Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Now, he didn't really just bless us, but notice, if you will, what Paul says. He's blessed us in heavenly realms 
with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He didn't give you just a taste of blessings. He blessed you with every spiritual blessing in a very special place, in the heavenly realms. Verse number four, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You remember those schoolyard days when people used to divide up and start choosing sides? And if you were like me, you may have been way down the list before you got chosen. Well, God chose you early in the game. Even before he created the world, you were on his mind and he was choosing you to be on his side. He chose you to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure, with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of his grace. Now just think about what Paul is saying. He's really just kind of giving us a taste of all the reasons that we have to worship God, to praise him for who he is. He's blessed us. He's chosen us. He predestined us. He has been working on our behalf. And matter of fact, he continues in the book. In chapter 2, he opens with, You were dead in your trespasses and sin. But just a few verses later, he says, But God, who's rich in love, he has extended his mercy to us. Even while we were dead in our sins, he has made us alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, I can't think of his name now. Uh, Snodgrass is his last name. He was a professor at North Park Seminary up in Chicago. And he says that, The book of Ephesians really is a long doxology, a reason to praise God for all the things that he has done. And this is what Paul is trying to do. Get us to realize that we need to praise the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our culture, praise and worship sort of go together. Matter of fact, we sometimes will talk about how we love praise and worship music. And we're really just talking about a style, but we're talking about that which generates in our heart a desire to worship and to praise God. You know, you were built for praise. You really were. And you actually do practice praise. You actually practice worship all the time. I have three grandchildren. And I can tell you without hesitation, my wife worships those three grandchildren. Uh, matter of fact, many of you, uh, you know, if you talk to my wife just a minute about grandkids, her eyes are going to light up, her smile is going to come across her face, and she'll start talking about those grandchildren. And if you got a minute, she'll pull out her phone, which I happen to have here. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I get tickled. Donna Johnson, who works over at Kelly's Kitchen, uh, when she had her first grandbaby, uh, she was running around that restaurant just showing everybody that would stop and look all about her grandchildren. And uh, when you walk in the door, she'd say, have you seen my grandchildren? And uh, one day she stopped me and said, have you seen my grandchildren? I said, yes, you showed them to me yesterday. She just looked at me kind of sheepishly and she said, well, would you like to see them again? I told her about that some time ago, and she looked at me, and she said, you didn't say no, did you? (laughs) I certainly did not, Uh, and I am the same way now. A couple of years ago, we had Dan Garland from up in Kentucky come to our association and uh, do a, a Sunday school conference for us, and one of the things he said is one of the greatest evangelists that he's ever known is a grandfather or a grandparent with a cell phone. Because they'll show pictures and talk about their grandchildren to anybody they can get to stop long enough and listen. And that is true. We are grateful. We are proud. We praise our grandchildren. And as I mentioned, 
We even worship our grandchildren. Now, God doesn't have a problem with any of that. Matter of fact, God wants you to love those that he's put in your life. He really does. Well, the problem with that is, is comes in is when we get to a point where they take place above God. When we put those kind of things in front of our praise and our worship of God, then that becomes problematic in that God no longer has the preeminent place in our lives. We need to always put God first. Matter of fact, Jesus at one time said, if you don't love me more than your mother, your brother, your father, your and he just goes down this long list of things, we have to put him first. Jesus said it like this, you can't be my disciple. You're not being a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ unless he has the preeminent place in your life. And that's where we find ourselves getting into trouble. Look, if you would, in Isaiah. It's there on your screen. Isaiah 14, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How thou art cut down to the ground. And then notice what he says, which didst weaken the nation. Notice that Lucifer at one point was weakening the nations of the world. How in the world did he do that? Look at verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Now, you, you realize that Satan is trying to take the place of God. He's wanting to be a step above God. He's wanting God to look up at him. Rather than him worshiping God as God, he wants people to look at him. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never thought much about worshiping God. But if you remember, one of the things that he did here was he weakened the nations. If he couldn't get people to worship him, Satan, then he'd at least get them to not worship God. Now, you're very familiar with this. <laughs> Several years ago, we had a fellow that attended our church, and I uh, was talking to him one day about his daughter who was uh, attending Auburn at the time. And after a month or so of being down there, I asked him, how's she doing? Is she adjusting to college life? And he said, oh, yeah, she is a true Auburn fan now. Now, what I thought he meant by that was she was bought all the T-shirts and, you know, she was knowing all the War Eagle songs and all the Auburn jokes and all of that. But, I, you know, that's what I was thinking. But I went ahead and asked him, I said, what do you mean a true Auburn fan? He said, well, I knew she was a true Auburn fan. Because she not only wanted Auburn to win every game they played, she wanted Alabama. Y'all know the story. What does she want Alabama to do? Lose, yeah. See, if I can't win every game, at least I don't want you winning every game. And this really is the trick of Satan. This is exactly what Satan wants to do. If he can't have you worship him, at least he wants to interfere with you worshiping God. Look at how we see this played out in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible says that God put man in the Garden of Eden, and he told him, you can have everything here in the garden, but there's one tree, you don't need to eat from that tree, because when you eat from that tree you will surely die. But notice what Satan says when he comes along. God, he says to man, God knows that when you eat of the tree, uh, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Now, this is exactly what Satan had thought in Isaiah 14. And now he's trying to tempt mankind 
with the very way that he himself thinks of himself. God knows that your eyes will be open and you will be like God. It's as though Satan is saying to himself, you may not worship me, but at least I don't want you worshiping him. And so he tempts us to worship ourselves or to worship our house or as I mentioned earlier, to worship our grandchildren. Anything he can tempt you with to get you to put them above God, that's exactly what Satan wants to tempt you to do. And folks, I need to tell you, it is something that any of us, matter of fact, all of us, can be tempted to do, to put things above our relationship with God, whether it's money, whether it's our time, whether it's our talents that we have, whatever it may be, God, uh, Satan wants to tempt you to elevate that to a place of worship and get you to worship that even more than you worship God. Let me show you how easy this is to, to happen in life. Over in the book of Revelation, we see where John writes a letter to seven different churches. And notice, if you will, this first letter that he writes to the church at Ephesus. Uh, the angel of the church uh, in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. And he begins by saying all these wonderful things about this church. I know uh, these are the words of him that holds the seven stars in his right hand. And walks among the seven golden lampsticks. I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men. And that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. And you have found them to be false. You have persevered and you have endured hardship for my name. And you've not grown weary. Here's a church that's doing all the hard stuff. I mean, they're even having church discipline inside the building. You have those that are claiming to be apostles, but they're not. And you have tested them. And you have dealt with that particular issue. You've persevered. You've gone through hard times. You have really worked hard. Sometimes we can work so hard at church that we miss the whole purpose of why we are doing church. Miss the one that we've come to church to worship. Y'all heard about Mary and her little lamb, didn't you? You know, it's real easy to get so busy in church that, uh, that you lose sight of what church is all about. Mary had a little lamb, and it would have been a sheep, but it lo uh, joined the local Baptist church and Died from lack of sleep. Baptist churches will let you do whatever you want to do. You can work yourself to death in a Baptist church if you want to. Bill Hybel said years and years ago when Willow Creek was just getting started and it was really beginning to grow and to bloom and blossom into the great church that it is today. He, he one time said that the way he was doing the work of God was destroying the work of God in him. Sometimes we can get on a, like a stationary bike. We're just pedaling and pedaling and pedaling. We're not really, we're just going faster and faster, but we're not, not really making any progress whatsoever in our spiritual life. And folks, I want to tell you, the devil will let you do all that you want to do, even work yourself to the point where you are destroying the very reason that you've come together in the first place. Satan will try every way he can to get you to get your focus off of worshiping God and begin worshiping anything else that will hinder you from worshiping God. Now notice Paul, I mean John says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. There comes a point where we love God and we're doing all of this for God and yet all of this hard work, all of this church work really replaces the love that I had for God. 
And then he gives us some words that he wants us to think about. Look, if you were, at, the, at verse number five. The first word that he gives us is the word remember. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Just stop and remember. And that's exactly what I want to ask you to do today. I want you to stop and I want you to remember. I want you to think back to a time and see if there is a time in your life where you can honestly say that I used to have more passion about worshiping God than I do now. I used to have more passion. There used to be more excitement about getting to get together with the other people of God because we used to just sing those songs and we would, we would have so much uh, energy when we would gather and we would worship God. Can you remember a time in your life where you really had more passion in your heart toward worshiping God than you do now? Several years ago, we were having a 21 days of prayer. And I remember when we first started, I just thought, oh, Lord, 21 more days, getting up early and getting things started. And I wasn't excited about it at all. But about the third or fourth day of the first week, God just sort of touched my heart in a fresh way. And every morning, I got a little more excited about being able to come to that time and have that time of those devotions and that time of music and praying to God. And by the end of the 21st day, I was so excited about those 21 days of prayer. I actually saw myself go through a sort of pre, uh, uh, transformation, if you will, as I saw my cold heart at the beginning really just get set on fire for the things of God. And I remembered all that time of watching that fire get stirred up in my heart once again. I wonder if there's a time in your life when you look back and you see that my life really used to be more excited about my worship of God. Expressing love to God used to be something I was so passionate about. Now I just kind of come and we sit and we sing some songs and I try my best to stay awake through the sermon and I have even told my husband or my wife, now you punch me in case he hushes. Y'all heard about that little boy. He went to church one Sunday and there was a man sitting there and uh, he put his hand down on the pew in front of him and after a few minutes his arm kind of dropped down beside him and the little boy got to looking and there was a tag attached to his coat sleeve. It said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If he should hush before I wake, Please give this arm a gentle shake. Right in front of me. Sometimes we just need to remember when our lives were more passionate about the things of God than they are now. And that's exactly what John is instructing us to do. Yes, I have left my first love. And the first thing I need to do is just remember. The second thing I need to do is repent. Now, we're in the midst of Bible, Bible school this, this month, and one of the things I remember when, from when I went to Bible school and even when I used to help with Bible school is repentance is most often given as heading in one direction and as the uh, verse says, remembering, looking at my life and evaluating that I've gotten off track and repentance means to turn around and start back in the direction that I need to go. There may be some of you here today, and what you need to do is remember. You need to think back to that time when your heart was passionate about the things of God. And there may be some of you here, and you need to do exactly what the second part of this is saying. And that is you need to repent. You need to turn around. You need to acknowledge that you have gotten off track and you need to get back on track. You need to repent and go back to the place where you know you need to be. And then notice the third thing he tells us to do. 
to do. He says, do those things that you did at first. As you remember and as you repent, maybe you need to go back to doing some of the things that you used to do. I've told you that Rick Warren says that worship is expressing our love to God. Many times in our culture, when we use the word love, we think love is this noun. It's this feeling that you have. It's the warm fuzzies that are on the inside. And if they hit just the right spot, my heart flutters and everything is so good. And I start feeling love again. But folks, love in the Bible is not a noun. Love in the Bible is a verb. It is something that you do. It's exactly what he's telling us here to do. We need to remember, we need to repent, and then for many of us, we need to go back to doing the things that we used to do. Now, quite honestly, there are some of us here today, our, our love has just sort of grown a little cold. We've gotten set in our ways, we've gotten a little older, we feel more mature, and our love has just sort of grown a little cold. For some of us, it is the result of 2020 and the pandemic that has faced our world over the last several months. And being out of touch with so many has caused our heart to sort of drift a little bit or gone a little cold. And we need to remember and we need to repent. But all of us maybe need to get back into the game of doing the things that we used to do when our hearts were more passionate toward the things of God. I remind you that in Matthew 7, Jesus tells a story about two men. Both men built a house. One built his house on a rock, and the other built his house on the sand. Now, the difference between these two guys is not that one was a smarter builder than the other. Both were hearing the word of God. The difference between these two guys is that one was hearing the word and putting it into practice. He was doing something with the word that he was hearing. He was building his house on rock. The guy that built his house on the sand, he was hearing the very same word. They may have been sitting together right in the very same worship service, but the one who built his house on the sand was not practicing the word. He was not putting it to practice in his life. He wasn't doing the word at all. James chapter 1, the Bible says, do not be merely hearers of the word, do what it says. And this is exactly what John is inviting us to do. Do those things that you used to do when your worship was something you were passionate about, when your worship stirred your heart, when your worship used to lift your spirits. And you didn't wake up on a Sunday morning and just think, oh, Lord, we got to go back to church today. But you woke up on a Sunday morning. Matter of fact, you went to bed on Saturday night thinking, boy, I can't wait till in the morning. I get to go back to the place the house of God, and worship the God that I love so dearly. This is what we have in mind when we talk about the discipline of worship. It is something you put your heart into. You discipline yourself to really engage in worship of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for each person who is a part of this gathering today. And Lord, if there's any here today that has never opened their heart and received forgiveness of their sin, I pray that today might be their day of salvation. Father, I pray for Christians here today who you are speaking to, even at this moment, about the issue of worship. Worship needs to be more than just coming and sitting and listening to songs and listening to a message. Father, worship needs to be a time where we really express our love to you. And there may be those here today who really need to hear what the writer of Revelation is saying as he challenges us to remember, to repent, 
and start doing those things that we used to do when worship used to be more vital in our heart than we find it today. Father, I pray your blessings on each person here today. And Lord, if there are decisions that you'd have us to make, I pray that we will make those decisions for your glory and for your honor. I pray these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, if you're here this morning and you have never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to tell you that is the whole purpose of us gathering in this place today. We want you to have a personal relationship with him. And you can if you'll open your heart and trust him as your Savior and Lord. If there's anything I can do to help you in making that decision, if you have questions or you just want to talk further about it, I'd love to talk with you about that as we gather down here at the front. In just a moment, we're going to stand together, and as we sing, I'll be here at the front, and if you'd like to talk about that, I'd love to, uh, love to talk with you any way that I can. There may be other decisions on your heart. Perhaps you are a Christian, and today you need to spend some time just remembering what God has done in your life and just reflecting on all those times where you used to be more passionate about your worship than you are now. For some, it may be that you need to repent. You find where you've drifted off course, and you need to start heading in the other direction. And for all of us, it may be that we just need to start doing, uh, once again, those things that we used to do at first. I don't know what God may be speaking to your heart about today, but if there's a decision that you need to make, we're going to stand together and we're going to sing. And as we do, you come. I'll meet you right here at the front. Let's stand together. and pull at your command so you can still my heart with your hand you tell the sea Thank you. 
Holly Joe, come join me on the stage if you would. This is Miss Holly Joe's last Sunday to be with us. In the early service, we made some presentations to her. You see there on the screen uh, flowers that are here on the table. Uh, we presented tho those to her. And also a bracelet. Wow, I didn't know it was that pretty. Man. Uh, a bracelet and also a gift certificate for... Yes, we figured after eight years with us, she needed some repair work. Anyway, a uh, gift certificate there, and so we just want to say thank you for your service to us over the last eight years. I know that many of you will want to speak to her. I asked her in the early service if there were some rules to doing so. Uh, remind me of the rules. Uh, you can shake your hand. Uh, they just can't hug your neck. Air hug, yes, a 30-foot hug, so a hug from here to there. So anyway, uh, if you want to just let her know how much you love and appreciate her, uh, please do so. Now, today is not the last day you can do that. She'll still be hanging around with us forever, and so uh, you, you, you do let her know how much you love and, and care for her and how grateful we are uh, for her leadership over these uh, last eight years. John, you have some closing words for us before we dismiss? Don't forget to tell Alex how glad you are to have him as a part of our church. Bless you, Alex. All right, so you guys have some jobs today. Alex, make sure you talk to Alex. Tell him uh, how excited you are for his decision. Make sure you talk to Holly, Joe, and Miss Alex and tell them how grateful you are to them for what they've done. Uh, what? Yeah, this, they're both Alex. It's, it doesn't make great people are named Alex. That's what we found out today. Um, also in your bulletin, there's a deacon, or yeah, in here there's deacon nomination forms that need to be filled out today, correct? Today and, today and next Sunday. So, uh, make sure you fill out your deacon nomination form. You can see what that's about and see the eligible men, but also, uh, the qualifications for a deacon in there, you can drop them off in the offering boxes. There's one there, and there's one over here. So uh, make sure you guys do that. Uh, VBS is going on the entire month of June. So listen, if you weren't here last week and you're like, oh, we missed it, false. Uh, you can be a part of VBS by showing up this week, and we will find a place for you to be involved, find a place for you to serve. And it is an awesome joy to watch kids just come together, and, and man, they just have a blast at VBS, and you get to be a part of that. And we all know uh, the, whole, the overall purpose is that they will uncover the truth of Scripture during that. And so you get to be a part of that. Uh, other two things I'm supposed to tell you guys about. Walk through Bethlehem coordinator meeting next Sunday. And then we have a youth worker meeting. Uh, if you are a youth worker, you're interested in being a youth worker, um, that's the following Sunday. So those are two things I was supposed to tell you guys about. Alex, Holly Joe, and Alex. Uh, and deacon nomination are the things that need to be done today or, or, or quickly with some importance. So uh, I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, you guys have a wonderful day. We'll see you all later. <laughs>